Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to PTP. We've only just begun. No, I'm not going to break out in song. I was thinking about it. We are here today with Kevin Salvage, Stephen Holmes from Leader at Gerard Phillips, and Ryan Morris from Arista. And this is all about PTP. I'm so glad you're here. Over to you, Kevin. Cindy, thank you once again for the introduction. And Steve, it's good to see you again. Yeah, Kevin, it's good to see you also. Uh, we'll be seeing you in person in just a little bit. And I come up with something that we hear quite a bit that I believe Aristotle famously wrote, that the more you know, the more you realize what you don't know. And that's never been more true than when we're just getting into PTP and a lot of the little nuances because there's so much involved in getting it through the network, getting it through clean. But once you do it right and get the setup, it actually runs very nicely and very smoothly. So with broadcast profiles still relatively new and with all the new standards come along, we're gonna take a look at some of the best practices and we've got some of the best people in the industry to help us out here. Kevin? We certainly have. So I'd like to introduce, we have Gerard and Ryan from Arista. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you, you uh, very much. Yeah. Uh, is it worth ourselves giving giving ourselves a little introduction before we get please going? Please do. Please certainly. do for those uh, who, don't, who are not familiar with you. Cool. Okay. So Gerard Phillips, I'm a systems engineer at Arista. I joined Arista about six years ago. I joined from what was um, Snell, uh, Sam, Snell Advanced Media at the time. Um, if, so I've been at, well, at Snell and Wilcox, Snell, Sam, all those companies. I've been at those guys for about 22 years. So I'm a broadcast guy, and I kind of realized that IP was the way forward. And I also realized I was never going to learn enough uh, if I stayed at a broadcast company. So I kind of Jumped the fence. I, I spent a lot of time at the uh, JTM interops. I really enjoyed those. I spent a lot of time sat next to Robert Welsh. Big shout out to Robert who helped to, um, you know, kind of cement some of my understanding of how all this stuff worked. And I realised that, um, that that these Arista guys seem to know what they're talking about, and uh, and I might learn some more IP when I when I joined Arista. So I joined and then discovered. Uh, great quote steve i i suddenly realized how little i actually understood about ip and so i have i've spent six years um becoming a lot more familiar with with multicast and ptp uh, and you're absolutely right if you, if you build these things properly they work very well but there's um I, I like to say it's not it's not rocket science but you do need to kind of build on the best practices and the lessons learned so that's kind of what i'm here to try and help with Thanks. Ryan. Uh, Ryan Morris here. Uh, yeah, Ryan Morris here, systems engineer at, uh, at Arista, obviously. Uh, before joining Arista, I actually worked at uh, Imagine Communications. So kind of similar career trajectory, I guess, as as Gerard. I like to say I'm a North American version of of Gerard. So, you know, aspire to, to be like him. Um, but yeah, I've been broadcasting my whole life as well. And, you know, uh, now, with, uh, now at Arista, you know, deploying many SMPTE 2110 and other uh, video workflow systems for customers throughout the world, coming up with best practices, obviously a keen focus in PTP, multicast and, and, uh, and orchestration. And um, happy to be here today to talk about, you know, what we've learned at these various, uh, various deployments, what, 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 you know, best practices and, you know, some gotchas, I guess. So thanks for having uh, me. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to, I'm going to make it clear that, uh, I am the European Ryan, so let's just. Uh... <laughs> I think people know that Steve's in LA and I'm in London, so we've got that one covered on the leader side. <laughs> so just a quick one for everyone on the call. If you're brand new to PTP, you can stay tuned, but this session is going to assume that you've got a fairly basic understanding of it. And we're not going to go into the, the basic terminology and what they are. We're going to assume you know that. As I said, you're more than welcome to stay, but we have a lot of information that is available on our YouTube channels, and we can point you to that at the end. So without further delay, 
I'm going to get the ball rolling. And what better place to start than the question we get asked by a lot of customers, I need to expand my network. PTP is working. Why do I why do I need a PTP aware switch when I continue to build this? It's working. So there are I'm right. I think you're probably the best place to start on PTP aware yeah. switches. Yeah. So I, I'll start with this one then. Um so it, it, it's that's a really great question, right? I mean, people have been building AES 67. Dante Ravenna networks for a long time. You know, the, the kind of precursor to 2110, the, the move to IP for video was was the move to IP for audio. And that that's been that's been around for 10 years, maybe longer, 15 years, who knows? Um, and PTP has been a a key part of that protocol stack ever since inception. And most of those audio networks are built on on switches without PTP awareness. Uh, whether that's PTP version one or version two, we'll cover that later, I think. But um, yeah, there's, there's a great question there. Why do why do we need PTP in a 2110 environment? And the I guess if you look back at some of the earlier earliest deployments, they didn't have PTP in in the network. They had well, they had PTP in the network, but they didn't have a PTP aware switch in the network. So um, <clears throat> some of the earliest systems I built were for um, a timeline TV. I helped build their truck, their first UK truck, and um, that had a big 7500 chassis in it, uh, 7504, I think it was, lots of endpoints. And it was before we released PTP boundary block um, for that, that series of switches. And they so they had no PTP aware switch. Um, and it did it worked perfectly fine. Um, and it worked perfectly fine because it was a single, single hop, because the scale wasn't huge and because the number of endpoints weren't huge. Um, so when you start to need PTP is pretty much when the scale starts to grow a little bit. And when you're starting to push towards having the, the, the most performance you can get out of your network. Um, it, there's a really interesting chicken and egg thing here, I would say. Uh, my experience is that um, some of the earlier PTP endpoints, you know, media hosts, they were pretty tolerant to some pretty unpleasant PTP. And that's probably because they were born in the era where it wasn't possible to always have a PTP aware switch. What I'd say these days is I think a lot of the endpoints are quite a lot less tolerant of a non PTP aware network. So there's a little bit of chicken and egg there, but basically if you're building a half decent, reasonably scaled uh, 2110 network, you, you are going to need to seriously consider PTP uh, awareness in your network. Ryan, what do you think? Did I miss something there? No, you know, you captured that pretty well. And, you know, just from, you know, a customer system that I was working on a few years back. Um, you know, we, we also had a mate had a large chassis for the video traffic, but the leaf switches were, you know, for audio mainly, uh, were not PTP aware at all. And a lot of these audio devices were actually, or some of these audio devices were actually like one gig connections, which makes sense because, and that's why they're going to be on audio leaves. And because they didn't support PTP at all, they kept dropping in and out on from PTP. Like the lock just was not stable. So we ended up having to actually waste 100 gig interfaces on our on our chassis to connect these one gig audio devices because the chassis was operating as a boundary clock and it provided the proper PTP timing to all these audio devices. So it just kind of, you know, I just want to highlight that because like, you know, what Gerard said is, you know, more and more switches now, or most of the switches now, at least from, from, from Marissa, support boundary clock. And it's important to have these throughout your network, have these kinds of, PTP aware switches, especially within a facility. I think if you um, if you look at twenty, you know the twenty one ten spec, uh, and and think about why you need PTP. Think well, think about why you need uh, timing. I guess is the first question, and it's it's um, we kind of get a little bit of hit, hit up about lip sync and things like that. But the the requirements for lip sync are pretty loose in terms of nanoseconds. Um, where it becomes really important is when you're talking about kind of audio multi channel audio kind of you know stereo or 5.1 or even you know beyond that right your the the AS recommendation is that you you have a um clocking accuracy of I think it's a tenth of a sample maybe a fifth of a sample but if you do the maths it's it's the plus or minus 500 pretty much plus or minus 500 nanoseconds plus or minus a microsecond it's it's the numbers that were originally in the 2059-2 um spec which I, I think have been taken out now but in in order to achieve 
kind of plus or minus 500 nanoseconds or, or plus or minus even a microsecond, you, you, you do now have to start building a network that is PTP aware. Otherwise, other traffic gets in the way, jumbo frames get in the way. You, you basically just end up with, with more and more and more jitter packet, uh, you know, packet delay variants in the, in, in the endpoints. And, and they have to, they have to do more and more complex maths to get rid of that and, and have a, an accurate and stable clock. Yeah, I think also, another point. Sorry, uh, stay going. I think also we're getting to the point where we're getting enough endpoints where if you didn't have a PTP aware switch, you could overwhelm the grandmaster from the traffic perspective. It can only handle itself so many endpoints. And to be able to multiply those number of endpoints, you have to have boundary clocks. Well, no, yeah, sure. And, and now you're kind of into the conversation about whether it's boundary clocks or transparent clocks. And, and both both do a great job of, of providing good timing accuracy and, and delivery. Boundary clocks are, are always our preference because they do a bunch of other things. They kind of, they give you a whole load of tools to kind of give you security. Um, they they give you a lot of monitoring, a lot of visibility of what's going on. And, and exactly what you've just said there, really, they, um, because each... Each boundary clock is essentially, uh, I, I think of a boundary clock as, as like a, a re-clocking uh, system. It, it, it's a gen-locking system. It gen-locks itself to the upstream clock, and then it delivers that new clock to the downstream devices. And so it, it allows you to, to, to decouple the number of hosts that you need to get PTP to in a large system, certainly a leaf and spine system. So um, those, those grandmasters, you know, often grandmasters are limited in, in the number of software cycles they've got to deliver PTP. And so if you can offload some of that and scale some of that up with a boundary clock, you're, you're in a really good place. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and how often do you guys see that, like, you know, different endpoints require different timing rates, different messaging rates? You know, I see some that require message rate of, you know, you know AS67 rates, others with 2059 too. And, you know, that's another advantage, I think, of a boundary clock is that on a per port basis, you can specify what the actual messaging rates will be whereas i probably cannot do that on a on a transparent clock uh, you would need possibly multiple gms i don't yeah. know how, how was this dealt with actually before before boundary clocks was it multiple gms i don't i don't actually know no i, I think it was everybody had to go to whatever the grandmaster was putting out and suck it up and make it work and the, the other the other scale issue is um is a is a kind of a, a peer scale issue. So the, we just talked about kind of a grandmaster scale issue. Now we can talk about a peer scale issue, and that is, in a in a non PTP aware network or a, or a transparent clock network, then um, you all know about management messages, right? So management messages, the TLBs that come from the grandmaster in twenty fifty nine, they're kind of in there to say what's the frame rate, what's the jam lock time, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and twenty fifty nine dash one probably i can't remember which one it is one of them um the profile specifies that um management messages should not be acknowledged using a multicast acknowledge um <clears throat> so gen gen generic ptp you can send a management message by multicast and then the receiver can multicast its acknowledge it, it's a bit of a it's a slightly strange thing to do because the problem is you potentially then have all of the endpoints that receive that acknowledge, acknowledging the acknowledge. You, you potentially end up in a broadcast storm of, of management messages. And so 2059 says, no, you, you can send management messages, you can send them as multicast, you can send them as unicast, but you must respond. If you're going to acknowledge them, you must acknowledge as a unicast um, response back. So you, you've got kind of two things in here. You've got this, um, if you can... Um, break some of these loops and prevent some of this kind of um, endpoints sending messages that end up being repeated, you can start to scale things further. I guess the other one is is um, delay requests. So um, if you are sending a, a delay request as a multicast message, that's going to everybody else in your same network. So if, if you're looking at transparent clock or looking at um, looking at a, a non ptp aware network and all your endpoints are doing delay requests as as uh, multicast then they'll get delivered to everybody so all of a sudden your your microphone with a small cpu is having to deal with hundreds or thousands of delay requests that are not for it that they're, they're supposed to go back to the the gm and so 
Uh, boundary clocks is a, is a great way of dealing with that because the boundary clock the boundary clock trunk um what does it do it, it terminates the, the conversation so the delay requests will go to the port that the host is on and it will be dealt with at that point it won't go any further so um whilst we say one of the best practices is to make sure that your endpoints are in hybrid mode i.e they do uh they're expecting multicast syncs multicast announces but they do unicast delay requests um, an easy way to enforce that is to use boundary clocks everywhere. Excellent. There we are. We've, we've started getting into the terminology already. Yeah. <laughs> so so is, this the, is this the point where we <clears throat> touch on? I mean, we've sort of got it there that there are different versions of PTP. Yes, I was just going to ask. So I know people talk about different things and get a little confused when we start talking about audio and Dante and other things, and they don't realize that there are different versions of PTP. So could you take just a real quick second and just kind of touch on that? Yeah. Should I take that one, Ryan, or do you want to take that one? I'll go for it, Ryan. Okay. So, um, so PTP is unbelievably flexible. Um, you'll have come across things called profiles. Um, that's kind of not really what we're trying to talk about here, if you like. PT the PTP that we are using, that is mandated by um, 2110 or 2059. The PTP that, we, that is mandated by 2059 is actually PTP version two. So you'll see it as PTP v2, or you'll see it as 1588, um, 2008, 2019, or whatever version it happens to be. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is it's, there was a version one um, and there still is a version one. The version one is pretty much deprecated, but it is still used by, um, can still be used by a number of AV protocols. So we often, where I most often see it is kind of in, in the kind of uh, Dante and Ravenna sort of world. Um, so the, the thing, thing that we need to be careful of is, is that um, when we talk about PTP aware switches, we're generally talking about a PTP version two aware switch, um, because it because version one is deprecated. It there's there's very little support elsewhere, um, and so if you have got to deal with a kind of a mixed environment of of version one and version two, um, and and they're not backwards compatible. I mean, they use the same multicast group. Uh, but the, the the packet structures are just completely different and non non compatible, um, and so uh, if you end up needing to kind of mix these two, you just you can do it. You need to take a bit of care. Um, so you'll typically find it with audio. Um, often those devices can be configured to use PTP version two, uh, and if you can do that, that's that's better because that allows you to. Um, kind of share the same timing planes with with all the video devices and the AES67 devices that are in the 2110 environment. Um, but if you, if you are entirely, you know, if you are forced to have a, a, an a, a, a PTP version one environment, then um, have a look, have a look to see whether your PTP aware switches can deal with both PTP version two and PTP version one. Uh, Arista switches I can speak about, others I don't know so much. The Arista switches typically have got um, uh, a capability to forward PTP version one through a PTP version two enabled port. So you can mix the two together. Um, you can deliver them through the same network. You would obviously have to have two GMs, a PTP version one GM and a PTP version two GM. Um, now, <clears throat> can the GMs deal with getting, because they're all the same multicast group. So can they deal with getting lots of different sets of you know, PTP version one and version two, I don't know. But I, I guess at least, you know, at least the switches can can typically be configured to operate uh, it, with knowledge of version one and version two. But if you can avoid it, please do. And George, sorry, the PTP it's... version one is just regular multicast as well at this point, right? It is not yeah. like the CPU messages like on a boundary clock, for example, just straight up multicast. It, it, it'll be treated, yeah, within a, a PTP version one forwarding network, it'll just be treated as regular multicast. So you've got to build a regular multicast network. You've got to deal with having a random selection of 239, oh, sorry, 2240, flows, some of which could be version two, some could be version one. So yeah, it, it, it's probably worth avoiding if you can. 
But obviously we have learned a lesson with the latest version 2.1 that is backwards compatible with version 2. Yes, and, and 2.1 brings with it quite a lot of good stuff. Um, I don't think much of it has been um, kind of transported through into the into the 2110 world, but it, it brings the ability to kind of bolt uh, security in multiple multiple different masters, um, giving you the ability to kind of vote for best clocks. Um, what else does it give you? Uh, it, it fixes, uh, there's some extra TLVs and things that are available that will make some of the 2110 TLVs or, or 2059 TLVs a little bit easier to operate. So I think it's definitely worth keeping an eye on 2.1, yes. So, hopefully everybody's keeping up with us so far. So let's move on to a subject that never ceases to cause confusion and panic. Best master clock algorithm. Um, what is a very simple algorithm? Providing you understand the basics of it. But it's still fascinating as obviously leader and manufacturer of a product that creates it that can act as a grandmaster, but also monitor the system to see there's some fairly simple gotchas out there that can absolutely floor your system. So um, I think we should take a look at a couple of those now. And I think the first one to start with is, if I just share my screen again. is talking about priority one and steve this is this is something that i know is a favorite subject of yours isn't it this one and how people set this up yes definitely um the biggest thing i've seen on priority one is people try to segregate their network by making different gms different priority ones and then they turn around and do their BMCA testing by yanking the fiber out. And that will switch every time correctly. But once they put the system in use and you end up losing, let's say your GPS antenna, so you no longer have lock to the satellite network, your clock class is gonna change. And if you notice the clock class sits between priority one and priority two. And when you have the clock class change to saying you're no longer GPS locked, it should walk over to the second grandmaster in waiting that has GPS. And it will not if priority one on the first grandmaster is a lower number. And you don't find that out until something catastrophic happens in your network and you end up on somebody who's still not G GPS locked when you've got a second uh, SPG that is locked to GPS and it won't walk over to it. So that's one of the biggest things that I've seen in that. Uh, the whole priority was set up that if you lose GPS, you still should lock to the unit that has GPS and you should seamlessly walk over to it. And you will not if your priority ones are not the same number. The second thing is uh, staying away from the default value of 127. Most devices when they're introduced into a network come in at 127. And I've seen devices come in at 127 and due to non adhering to the standard, they'll come up with things that will make them look like a better clock than what your grandmaster is, and there'll be a rogue clock and they'll take over your network. So the best thing is get away from that. We say that you should use a very low number. Uh, Arista's got a nice practice where they like to lay out the network and Gerard and Ryan will talk about their suggestion for all the values, but it's number one to get away from 127. Gerard, Kev? Okay. Yeah, if I if I just bring up that drawing now. Because, you know, we've seen this as well where 
various, especially boundary clock switches, if you haven't designed the system correctly, they can take over as the grandmaster. Yet you've got a perfectly good PTP generator connected to GPS that's sort of sitting there idly because the way you set up the priorities. And I know you guys have ways of enabling or disabling that, don't you, Joe and Ryan, within your architecture? Yeah. So, like, you know, we have ways, of course, of setting up various priority ones and priority twos on our, you know, on each of the local switches, assuming that they're boundary clocks. We have ways of enforcing that a specific endpoint can never become a GM by using a, a command called PTP uh, role master. Uh, and, you know, we typically always, you know, we typically have, you know, a topology that looks very similar to something like this where you have your GPSs at the top with the highest P1s, and then we use a tiered approach. Like every tier below down has like a consistent P1, for example. So like, you know, if your GPSs were P1 of one and both of them had a P1 of one, and then P2 may, for the first one might be two, and then the next one three or something like that. And then the, the uh, you know, the next tier below will have a P1 of 10, a different p2 values going across and then the other ones will have a p p1 of 20 like this drawing here is showing now you know this is typically what we use so we, we like the bmca to be pretty deterministic and we don't want any of the switches to become gms obviously um unless temporarily during a you know bmca action when a switch might be in holdover mode or if god forbid you lose all of your gms all at the same time um but you know the and the other thing that we very you know very much recommend is having a topology that looks similar to this from the perspective of ensuring that all of your switches will be locked to the same gm so if you lose one of your switches if you lose one of your links for example you know you could sustain a number you know a failure or you know a large failure again like a switch reboot or during an upgrade or anything like that and still maintain that lock across the entire network for you know so every device is locked to the same gm Gerard, do you typically ensure also that everybody's going to be locked to the same GM and not mix and match these throughout the network? Like throughout, like say, a 2022-7 network, have red connected to one GM, blue connecting to another GM? No, I think I think that's um that in my in my experience, that's never been a good architecture. I think you end up if we go if you if you end up with kind of a, a red GM and a blue GM separately you are essentially relying on the endpoints making bmca choices you know the endpoints are receiving a red and a blue and they've got to decide which one they want to lock to and that, there is no there's nothing in the nothing in the ptp standard that says a um an ordinary clock receiving well a, a, an endpoint that's receiving two clocks is actually two ordinary clocks there's nothing in the standard that tells a vendor that they should perform bmca and they should choose the best clock you, you'll find that they they do whatever they feel like doing um so the best way to ensure that it doesn't matter which clock they're receiving is to make sure they're receiving two of the same clock. So my like 100% super strong recommendation would always be to to do what you described earlier on, have a, have a pair of GMs or four or as many as you like uh, and make sure that you are delivering the same clock to everybody. The the I think what's worth what's, what's worth talking about is is that people are sometimes a bit confused by how BMCA works. Um, some, sometimes people think that it's um, that BMCA is a process where somebody's elected to be the master. And what we should remember is that it isn't. E e BMCA is run independently on every single endpoint. And what you're looking for is, that, is for only one of those endpoints to, be to become the master. And so it's um, e you have to be very careful. You have to make sure that everything is configured exactly correctly everyone's in the same domain you've got the priorities correct um without doing that it is possible for more than one device to believe it should be in charge um, and that, that's typically what's happening when steve was talking about um you know you add a new device it's got a, a funny p1 it's it thinks it's in the same domain as everyone else it, it's got you know somebody's put zero in it because they're in the lab and suddenly it's in charge um so as you as you mentioned earlier the the, the show the, sorry the ptp role master helps to prevent that another good reason for boundary clocks but um yeah you, you kind of it, it's it is worth in your lab it's worth having a lab and it's worth in your lab doing some bmca testing um you, you mentioned ryan that um you know we never want to see the switches be the 
the GMs. And, and that is true. But you also mentioned, which is also extremely important, that because of this distributed uh, election, if you like, distributed self-election, um, if if we go back to that, can we have that picture back, Kevin? The one we, we had just a minute ago. Off. The one we had a minute ago. Any of them with a with a PTP architecture. So if you imagine, um, oh yeah, that, yeah, that one's fine. Yeah. So if you imagine the top left GM is the one that is has elected itself, and everybody else has agreed to be the master. If if that if that one failed, what you would find is that the announce timeout period would elapse. So three announced messages would pass. The Arista on the top left would go, well, I've not heard any announced messages. I must be in charge. That's me. There's no other masters. I'm going to be it. It it will now start. It will now become the GM. It will enter holdover mode. It will carry on making clocks, but it will now announce that it's in charge. Um, it will it will start sending out its announced messages with its priorities and all of its other BMCA um, type um, data. Now, if depending on the P1s and the well, the, the P1s between those two top switches will be the same, but the P2s, depending on what the P2s are, the switch on the right will suddenly go, no, 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 no. I'm supposed to be in charge. I've got a better P2 than you. Um, or it'll say, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can be in charge. I see. That's fine. Either way, that second switch will start sending out announce messages. It will it will either forward on the ones it received from, from the first switch, or it'll start sending out its own ones saying, I'm a better clock than you. It's only at that point that the second GM goes, hang on a minute. I'm a better clock than anybody. I better start sending my announced messages. So you can see that um, people often say to me, why has why this switch become in charge for a bit? And it's completely normal. You will see during a BMCA event, during a failover, for whatever reason, you will typically see a ripple of who's in charge through the network. And it'll typically be that the top two will have a bit of a chat with each other and one of them will become in charge before the second GM pops up. And that, then the ripple might go the other way, but that ripple will then also ripple downwards. Now, that that's why the switches have got holdover mode. That's why they continue to make good clocks. And, and they do make good clocks. But uh, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be worried that you see this ripple of BMCA stuff happening through your network. The other thing I wanted to throw in at this point was... Um, can we have slide 26 Kevin yeah. um one of the one of the, it, uh, configuring PTP is notoriously tricky Think, things have got to be the same everywhere and if if things aren't quite the same everywhere you, you end up with a with some problems one, one of the things that that Ryan and I often see is the announced messages the announce message uh, interval is not the same at both ends of a link and that can cause trouble um that can cause one end to time out and believe it's in charge when actually the other end is supposed to be in charge. Um, so one of the things to think about is whether you can kind of move towards a, a model where you automate the provisioning of your network. And a really good example is if you automate the provisioning of a network using something like Ansible, or, or, or you know, we have a we have a set of collections that sit on top of Ansible. But for example, with with those collections, you can simplify the configuration of your PTP pretty much down to saying. I want PTP, please, and I want it to be an AES67 profile, and I want it everywhere. And, and you end up with configuration that that kind of follows best practice and can be deployed on all of the switches you've got. So that was a, I wasn't quite sure I was going to fit that one in, Kevin, but I fitted it in now, and I'm pleased. <laughs> I, 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 I just want to jump in for a real quick, uh, just to ease people's minds. Uh, when Gerard's talking about a ripple effect, it's a ripple of who is the grandmaster, not a ripple of time. Everybody's putting out the same time. So even when it walks down to one of the switches and it takes over, its holdover is still putting out the same time. So an end device isn't going to swing in time. All it is is the who is the grandmaster may change to that boundary clock for a brief second, and then it's gonna change back to that grandmaster once he's up and running, but they're all still putting out the same time. So there's not gonna be a hit to the system like most people think of from Blackburst, uh, that you would have a ripple down and the whole building swings. It's not, it's not a change in time. It's a ripple of who's the GM only. Yeah, and, and it Just is for a few seconds only, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and the great thing is that with 
the leader and fabrics test and measurement products you actually get in the event log you can have it set up to identify when the grand master changes so you can see the grand masters and this is a pretty good way also with the addresses that come up that you can figure out which device has come up so if you start to see a string you can google them they'll come up with who the manufacturers are so you'll see who the leader ones are the arista ones are and if somebody pops up that you're not familiar with go and have a look because it might be you know and we've seen this plenty of times where somebody has just plugged something on the network thinking okay i don't need to worry about this but it has you know the status to get in there and start playing in this in this setup so um I see, I see a question monitoring those. I was going to say, I see a question in the feed, which I'll just answer very quickly. So what, what is the benefit of forcing uh, speed and duplex on a port that faces the clock? Um, so, yeah, I've, I've had that question a couple of times recently. Um, my, I think it's a personal preference. My personal preference is to uh, lock automatic things down if you don't need the automatic thing. So if you've got a GM that's one gig and you've got a port that could be one gig, 10 gig, 100 meg, 10 meg, single Gplex, dual G, you know, I would bolt it down and say it's a one gig link. It, it's a bit more com config, but it, it and it, if you change the GM to be something else, you have to change it, but it, it kind of reduces one axis of possible error, in my opinion. But that may not be the way you like to build your network, so feel Well, auto, auto negotiation is a good thing, but it always doesn't always work either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially when you're talking about getting down to one gig, not everybody auto negotiates down there the same mm -hmm. and devices may not. So like you said, locking it, you don't have to worry about that getting in the middle and getting confused and the two devices not really talking to each other just because, you know, and I've, I've seen it change in the middle. Yeah, it started working, but something happened and all of a sudden auto negotiation just went out the window. And, and in a, in a steady state, it should be fine. But for example, rebooting a switch or re, rebooting a device, you're just giving everything a bit more lee leeway to not necessarily finish where you want it to be. I, I, my preference is to lock things down. So we've talked about PTP in a kind of very simple local area network. We're now starting to see more of our customers taking advantage of IP, looking at remote production, where they're going to bring all of these signals from a venue back to a production center, which may then be remote from the broadcast center and the playout center and that. And the question we then frequently get asked is, how do we synchronize? How do we use PTP over a wide area network? Yeah, I, I get asked that question actually quite a bit too late, uh, lately. And you know, one of my, my first responses really, unfortunately, is asking another question is what is the connectivity between the sites? And not just like, what is the connectivity, but also like, not just what kind of links, but what is what is actually gonna be connecting those links? You know, we've talked about the importance of having PTP aware switches. Well, not every, obviously not every switch is going to be PTP aware. And, you know, what is, so what is the connectivity from site A to site B? Is it gonna be going through just just exclusively like dark fiber like if so that's that's fantastic you know we can probably rely on the ptp algorithm to do its job and lock those sites together but or or is it going through you know an mpls network or is it going through a bunch of devices that are not ptp aware that will increase the amount of jitter between these networks that might cause there to be you know difficult, you know, difficulties in timing, you know, video between the different sites. If that's the answer, then typically what I, I end up recommending is having different GMs at each of the different sites. So that site one will lock to one GM, site two will lock to another GM, if, if need be, preferably, you know, obviously I'm sure everyone would rather just have everybody locked to the same GM. But again, if it's not going to be dark fiber, if, if you don't know what those links are going to do to the PTP packets, that could be very dangerous, especially if obviously if this is carrying, you know, live video traffic it can just be, it, it, it can be dangerous and going with the wrong model can be, can obviously cause downtime. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the, you know, we are talking about GPS locking. So the two sites having two different grandmasters will not have a time difference. I mean, the right. time difference is in the nano single digit, most likely nanosecond mm -hmm. range. 
I mean, it's incredibly accurate. It's it's not like the old days of Blackburst where, yeah, locking two to something may have a difference between a phase difference between the two. With GPS lock and PTP, it's it's got the lock accuracy of GPS. And so we're down in the nanosecond range. So the second site is going to be absolutely locked to the first site. I mean, I think one of the challenges we're now seeing with more of the OB companies and that, especially at a lot of these new sporting venues where the, the truck compound is underground, it's under the stadium. And you know, they don't have access, you know, they've got to put together something to get GPS. Now, obviously with, you know, devices, once they've locked, they stay in sync and, you know, for the seven, eight hours of production, they'll be fine. So I think I think we're we're starting to see quite a few things. I think I think we're starting to see uh, facilities like stadiums um, delivering infrastructure. So you know, quite often, quite often they're starting to build infrastructure themselves to to allow people to plug cameras in and to, to deliver PTP to people. So I think we'll see more of that. So I think the OB truck underground is going to become less of a problem. Um, I think we're also starting to see uh, OB truck vendors working with each other to share services like ptp um i think the thing one of the big things to remember i think is gms are relatively cheap um compared to all the other bits and bobs in your network and the reliability of your ptp is unbelievably important and so you should even think of these as failure domains you know if i lose my ob truck do i want that potentially to take out my broadcast center or if i lose lose the link from my broadcast center do i want to take that take out my ob truck I think um, as we're seeing bigger and bigger systems, we're seeing more and more people paying more and more attention. And I really like this path to segmenting their networks and segmenting the failure domains into things that will enable their businesses to continue to operate. In the, as these things get bigger, we will have failures. And what we need to do is make sure those failures don't propagate through to a very large scale. So in this drawing here, you could argue that you need to get the, the OB van a, a PTP feed, possibly if it's underground. But if you've got two facilities in two separate cities, I wouldn't be trying to save the money on GMs. I'd be delivering GMs to both of the both of those facilities. Excellent. Right. Let me just uh, stop sharing that one. So does that... Let's just... Go back to the list of questions we have here. So we've talked about PTP. This is the next challenge is actually monitoring it. What's going on? We've got two companies here. We both have products that um, can keep an eye on this and can log what's going on. So, Steve, do you want to quickly jump in here about the kind of things that people should be looking for when it comes to monitoring ptp because obviously most of the time it's just chugging along in the background yeah so um one of the nice things is where we're monitoring is at the endpoint with everything going on so one of the things that we have the ability to do is actually look at the amount of delay time that's going through the network and ptp mandates that the delay from the grandmaster, whatever is giving that to you, if it's a boundary clock or actually all the way back to the grandmaster, to the end device, and from the end device back to the grandmaster, that delay time be equal. And one of the things that can happen, and this is a chart actually graphing that delay time in both directions. So you can look at T2 minus T1, which is from the clock source down to the receiver, and T4 minus T3 is from the receiver back to the clock source, and verify that, yes, they are within very close microsecond range of each other. And the one thing that I have seen is when people expand their network and they don't pay attention to how much data they're putting on a specific piece of their network and they start uh, running into issues where they're actually uh, starting to 
get too much traffic on a specific piece on a port or on a specific piece of their network, you'll actually see the T2 minus T1 time start to increase. Or we've had devices that get in and start spiking this to where you're going to have issues with lock because you're getting huge timing spikes. And we have the ability to monitor that and make sure that those timing spikes don't happen. Um, do you have that one picture with the, the cars in it in here, Kev, or not? I don't think I have. I don't think so in this one. It's no. Okay. But for those watching uh, on catch-up, yes. it will be in there. Yeah. So I, I look at it, if you think about a freeway and you've got a ton of traffic coming one way, you've got all of your video, all of your audio, and the PTP coming down to that sync device. Going the other way, all you have is very little messaging going from the endpoint back to the boundary clock. And the PTP coming to that endpoint has to deal with all of that traffic. And if you overload a port, you can start getting very huge delays coming from that port down to you that you don't get going back the other direction. And you really get a lot of movement in your PTP sync because of those extra delays that are only in one direction and PTP wants it to be equal. So it's something that you really need to watch out for. Right, here we go. Ah, there you go. So, you know, your, your PTP coming to you, you know, is, is fighting the video, it's fighting the audio and everything else coming to you. And on a normal switch and normal conditions, it's absolutely just fine. But, and then your messaging going back is just like you in a single lane, you've got the whole port and the whole bandwidth to get those messages back. So the delay could possibly not be symmetrical in those conditions, but it's only when you aren't paying attention to what you're adding to the network. I, mean, I think the other, th the other thing to point out, Steve, as well, with the graphs we're showing there, they can be scaled anywhere from two minutes up to 72 hours. Yes. And the so one thing that... I've certainly learned about IP. It's about trends. It's about watching things yes. move. They don't suddenly drop off. They gradually deviate. Yes. And in, in some ways, that gives us the opportunity to react before it becomes critical. Yes. But you've got yeah. to pay attention to these. Yeah. And what I, I kind of call it, every, every network has its own signature when it's running correct. And you need to learn that signature of what those flows look like when everything is looking correct and then know when all of a sudden something's out of whack and the, the complete flow has completely changed or it's getting very erratic that you really need to look at something before it actually hits the failure point. But as we said, Steve, with the leader and the fabrics products, we can look at the end point. Gerard and Ryan, you've got tools that allow us to look what's going on inside. You, you switch and we've got a couple of screenshots you provided here you'd like to talk through you want to cover that one Ryan? um i'll cover parts of it sure um i'll hand it back to you so you know one of the you know one of the main reason one of the key benefits of a boundary clock is of course you know the the rich telemetry that comes with it so we can look inside of all of this in all of our switches for example and look at the you know for example like the offset from master or the skew, and it's, and and again, this is specifically in in uh, in boundary clock mode, and so you can connect in and look at and look at these sorts of values. You can CLI into the switch, run various show commands. It's it's very useful, but if there's a problem, you know, what are the odds that you're going to be exactly be CLI'd in at that exact same at that exact right moment and run the exact command on the exact right switch at the exact right time? You know, it's it, it's 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 probably not great, and it can be inefficient to have just someone staying there and just connecting in all the you know all the time. So that's where you know another Arista tool called CVP Cloud Vision Portal really comes into play. So one of the key benefits of Arista in general with our telemetry is that it's stream telemetry, so it's all real time. So we don't rely on polling every five seconds, ten seconds, thirty seconds. We don't rely on 
you know, data dumps or whatever from a, you know, every given interval, anytime there's any change in any of these, in many of these key statistics, such as again, offset from master or who is the GM or is there, you know, you know, who is the GM at a specific time, that data all gets streamed into CVP and can be collected for all of your switches within your topology. So you can go back to a certain time because we keep a, uh, we keep records of these for up to, I, I don't know what it is. It's like, it's, you know, it can be like over 30 days, for example. And you can look at specific events at specific times and how they impacted every single switch at that exact same time. And again, it's all real-time telemetry. So you can see what the offset from master is at all of the switches at, at all of the same time or who the GM is. So it's incredibly valuable to kind of be able to collect all this data for your entire topology and look inside the switch. So you have a leader who can look at specific, specific endpoints, and then you have Arista products, Arista solutions that can look inside the network at all periods of time as well. And you can do a lot of other really cool things like programming your own uh, kind of like some, you know, almost like your own, your own logging mechanisms within CVP. Jordan, are you able to describe some of that? Some of the other cool features you can use within CVP? Yeah, you can you can kind of you can connect CVP to external channels, so uh, Slack or um, Google Hangouts or whatever. It, send emails and stuff. So you, you can you can send you can have it send you messages when there are events. You you can configure the events to be so some of the events would be grandmaster change or um, offset from master above a certain number. So these are all great things to kind of mean that you don't have to keep staring at the screen all the time. I think I think it's. Um, <clears throat> I want to just jump back to one of to Steve's uh, car drawing, actually, because your car drawing is a very interesting drawing. But of course, it's entirely fixed by a boundary clock. Certainly in in Arista world, it's entirely fixed by a boundary clock because the traffic the traffic you see on the left hand highway, the, the really busy highway, that's the data plane traffic, and that goes to the ASIC. the The PTP cars, I don't know, the red ones. Um, on both sides of the carriageway, they go directly to the control plane, and they kind of they have a they, they have a super they're like a second lane. They they don't have to bother with that other data plane like, lane. They just go straight to and from the CPU. So um, I like the sto I like the the story there. It's very it's certainly very true in a non PTP aware network, but in in a boundary clock network, and actually I think in a transparent network, you would you wouldn't need to worry about that. But on the monitoring point, I think my key message would be don't leave the monitoring as a second you know don't don't leave it as, as a second thought consider it up front because it's it's uh, absolutely vital thank you i'm conscious that we're now heading up towards the top of the hour we've been talking um cindy fallon Actually, and Catherine, i think we've got some questions haven't we that we've been trying to answer as we go through so Kevin, there was actually a really good question uh, written earlier that I wanted. I was hoping that we'd be able to get to. So I'm I'm very happy that we can. So for like an OB truck environment where they may not have access to GPS, so that I guess maybe they're, maybe they're underground, and you're gonna have want to have multiple GMs within the truck. What do you guys recommend for keeping those GMs in sync because they're gonna be providing PTP to the network, but there's no GPS attached to them. So how do you keep them in sync? Well. That comes down to, you know, having a, a little bit of a tiered where you can have one clock master at the top and it provides the sync to two, your two grandmasters. And that way they both get a common sync point. Uh, trying to make one of them the sync point just gets really weird when they start switching between the two. If you have a tier where you have a grandmaster up here, a solid clock that can be coming in and it's feeding down to your two clocks underneath. They're both getting the same time. And now they do the BCMA between the two of them and they're running off of the same clock source, which in a normal SPG, video SPG, regardless pretty much of the manufacturer, it is going to be a crystal controlled or an oven controlled crystal, which is gonna have a very precise frequency. It isn't gonna drift. Yes, it's gonna be different than your delivery point, but we almost always frame sync that anyway. So you will have absolute stable clocking within your GM now or within the truck. 
you challenged me. I think this is the slide we wanted, isn't it, Steve? Yeah, that's it. So that you have one that is, is providing clocking down to the two clocks that will now be your 2110 BMCA Grandmaster and Master and Waiting Leader, whatever you want to call it these days. And as you pointed out, the, the, the unit at the top, the master clock here, is not part of the best master clock algorithm because it's on a different domain. Yeah. It's just so, providing the clocking down to the two units so that they their oscillators are actually 100% phase locked. All right, Are there we any do other have questions a lot. That's going to get me going through a slide deck to try and find it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of questions, and so I want to just let everyone know that um, if we don't get to your question, we're going to circle back to you afterward and and come back to everybody on on your questions. So no fear if Ryan didn't get to it uh, in chat and and now and what we're going to take here at the end of the session, we will get to you for sure. And also you can meet with us at IBC and you see the links in the chat on how to meet with all four of the hosts here, uh, the experts at IBC. So book a meeting and see them there. One question there's, we there's had, one I, oh, go ahead. I was say, there's, there's one that's appeared on there about quality of service. Go for it. And that is one that we, we've got in our back pocket here. Um, So again, this is something that probably falls more to Ryan and Daryl to talk about this because obviously it's it's within the switch again. Yeah, I think I can. Sorry, no, I was going to say, Daryl. I think you kind of referenced this earlier yeah. with the mm -hmm. with the with the you know pretty card drawing. So uh, the card picture. So just want to rehash that, I guess, and how that influences you know QoS or the not not the need for the you know how 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 you don't need QoS for I guess boundary clocks or TCs. Yeah. Yeah. In, I mean, so, in, the, so, in the linear world, you would. And with the use of boundary clocks, and especially the way Arista does it, uh, I, you've, you've gone around this uh, need, I would say. Yeah. I mean, to, to reiterate, really, the, the, from a boundary clock, the, the packets come from the CPU and they go onto the wire and they, they go along the wire and they go to another switch and they come out of the out of the switching ASIC straight to the CPU. There's no they they are the most important packets. They're like BGP and spanning tree and LLDP. They're like all of the other control plane traffic. So they get an absolutely guaranteed top class of service. They they're the ones that get poked in and pulled out of the FIFOs absolutely at the beginning. So the, the quality of service story typically has come from the audio world where we had non PTP aware switches and and in those worlds it was very important but in a, in the world of boundary clocks you absolutely don't need to worry about quality of service now yeah, sure. have you have you ever configured QoS on PTP packets or adjusted the DSCP on a boundary clock I I, I haven't I'm just no no the, the only the only time you'd ever need to do it is if you um and boundary clocks can do it as you as you suggest. Any time you ever need to do it is if you have non-PTP aware switches between that boundary clock and the next thing that it's going to. Yeah. Outstanding. Bendy, are, are there any more on there? There's so many. I'll here. just pick a couple. And Ryan, you may have touched on some of them already, but that'll share with the group here as well. A question that just came in. So does that mean we should never make an OB Grandmaster number one to allow for the TOC Genlock? I'll leave that to the leader team. I'm not sure I 100% understand that. Uh, but we can go back and, and follow and, up offline with that yeah, person. On, on that one slide that Kevin was showing where it was that triple stack, you have the one... Grandmaster on top, the, the SPG underneath on the left-hand side was the Grandmaster. So that's where you start with your priority one and priority two between those two bottom units. And the one on the left <coughs> does have, you know, in this case, priority one of one. The one on the right has priority one of one. And then you have priority two of one and priority two of two 
So the one on the left after the voting's done will become the grandmaster. If it falters for some reason, the one on the right will take over. But yeah, you, the one on the top is just providing the sync. You can think of it as the replacement for GPS, making sure these two units underneath are absolutely phase locked and frequency locked together to a clean clock source. And so everything else would be normal. And you do have to switch things around. And all you need to do is this top unit, if you lock this top unit to GPS, when the truck gets GPS, then yes, it will be providing now a GPS lock to both units underneath. So you don't even have to change any priorities. It's gonna go into holdover or internal clock when it loses GPS or doesn't have GPS and run off of its oven controlled crystal. If it has GPS, then it will be GPS locked and it will pass that GPS lock down to the two units underneath because we are locking those two units via PTP which has the same accuracy. It's the equivalent of GPS locking it. Nice. Well said. Anybody else want to add on to that? We'll take well, a couple said, more think, questions think, and wrap, or what do you want to do, Kevin? I, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll go through these and, and get back okay. to you. I'm just, I'm just scanning them now, and um, wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, as, as we said here, let me just... Uh, Get the next slide up and share this. We uh, there is a wealth of information that between our two companies we have available. Um, personally, I sat through a presentation that Ryan and Gerard did um, back at the end of um, March. Um, watch that; it's absolutely full of useful information. We at Leader, we have our YouTube channel, and there is a playlist on there. Your essential guide to PTP. And this video will be appearing on there very shortly. And also, if I keep talking, if you want to put your phones up, the QR code will allow you to download this white paper, which comes from an earlier session we did about how you ensure your black and burst survives the introduction of PTP. So as you go from an SDI to an IP world, how you make sure both of those work together. And as we alluded to at the beginning of the show, IBC is just around the corner. So if you're coming to Amsterdam in September, um, we will both be exhibiting at the show. Arista will be in Hall 11, um, Booth C14, and Leader and Fabrics will be in Hall 10. And if you want to book a meeting from the Leader and Fabric side, again, use the QR code on the screen and book a meeting. Steve and I will be there. Ryan? Gerald, are you, you both over as well for the show? I, I will be there. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I mean, if, if there's any questions that, that you didn't feel were answered or didn't get answered, or, or uh, obviously Kevin's uh, suggested that, that that we will be answering all these, all the, all the open questions, we'll do that. But if, if there's still something you want to talk about, PTP-wise or anything else, then please uh, either book a meeting or drop by or find me on LinkedIn, Gerald Phillips at Arista. Um, feel free to message me with anything that you would you don't you, you want to hear happy to help self as well brilliant well all thank right thank you everybody for joining us um i yes. hope you found that as fascinating as i did and you know i've come out of this now realizing there's even more i don't know <laughs> which is <laughs> which which was obviously you know the, the title of the conversation and as i said we've only just begun this stuff works other industries use it we're going to make it work. It's just understanding. And if you get the foundations, you can build extremely large, scalable systems that can grow at the pace your businesses do. And you can justify that decision years back when people said, I think we should do this IP thing because it looks like a good idea. It is. It's going to allow you to work completely differently. So Gerard, Ryan and Steve, thank you once again for sharing that with us. Cindy, Fallon, and Catherine for, for hosting us. And as I said, to anybody out there, please reach out to us. Um, if something comes up at the end of this, you think, ah, they didn't talk about that or they didn't mention it. And thank you once again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Cheers. Bye.